So I'm looking at these two charts, and you would sent me some slides, and it looks like our life expectancy is going down, especially in comparison to other, let's say, developed countries. But our health consumption expenditure as a percent of GDP, so the amount we spend on healthcare, is going up much higher than other countries. Like these lines diverge, and I'll, I can put these sh slides in the show notes here. But it looks like, as I'm no statistician, okay, but the graphs appear to show that the more we spend on healthcare as a country, the shorter our lives are, or the faster we seem to die, especially in relation to other countries. Yeah, it's in relation to other countries. You have to be careful about that. But if you look at the uh, slide number five, uh, I'm sorry, slide number two, uh, we can, we don't have to say this if we don't want to, but uh, after, at the right-hand side of the slide there, where the green line, uh, overall adjusted mortality rate, higher is worse, obviously. And from 2014 on, we've not improved. So when Obamacare came on board and 40% of uninsured Americans were became insured, the age-adjusted mortality did not improve while the other countries continued to improve. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, or the, Well, it does. It, I guess uh, it, it, it must make sense somehow. It just doesn't make sense if you're looking at it like, well, more people have health care, shouldn't more people be healthy and, and getting their health issues taken care of? Correct. Correct. So I think it's a very powerful testimony of the fact that our health care system is not as well oriented towards producing health as the health care systems of the other wealthy countries. And that's disturbing because we spend what, like a trillion dollars or something on health care every year. I mean, it's a ton. It's it's got you must have those figures, actually. How much is it? Yes. No, we're spending about four trillion a year on health care, but we're spending. Oh, wow about 1.6 trillion extra compared to the other countries. Extra. So that's wow. 1.6 trillion. That's like Build Back Better, 10-year Build Back Better plan. Every year we are spending in excess while our death rate continues to get worse than the, the other comparable countries that are spending 1.6, the equivalent of 1.6 trillion less. So not only is our quality of healthcare bad, but it looks like we're falling behind at a faster and faster rate, which is also sort of mildly terrifying. Like, we're not catching up. It's getting worse. That's correct. And if you look at slide number four, you could say, oh, well, that's all pre-COVID, but, but we, we jumped on the vaccines and we were good. In slide number four, it shows that prior to the pandemic starting, Americans lived 3.3 years less than the citizens of 19 other wealthy countries. And in those two years of the pandemic, 2020, 2021, that 3.3 years less grew to 5.3 years less. So our life expectancy is, I, I guess you would say, shrinking in comparison to other countries or possibly actually just shrinking. Both. Not good, folks. For not those good, of you at home. Good. That's, that's the summary. <laughs> that's the summary. The summary is we're dying faster and spending more to do it. And it's not just a little bit faster, it's a lot faster, and it's also spending a lot more, not just a little bit more. Am I close? That's absolutely correct. And that is the introduction to the conversation about why is this happening? How could this possibly be happening? So I don't want to draw a causal relationship that's not there but I'm, by bringing this up now, but I'm going to bring this up now anyway. We're one of, I think, two countries in the world that allows pharmaceutical companies to advertise. And... The other one is New Zealand, right? Right. But New Zealand seems to have a ton of oversight when it comes to this, whereas we're just kind of like, hey, put the whatever the hell you want on TV. That's exactly right. And more important than the oversight of the advertising, New, New Zealand has an active pharmaceutical, national pharmaceutical plan that provides oversight to ensure that their doctors are prescribing the most effective and efficient drugs and we are uh, among the only, perhaps the only wealthy country that doesn't have that kind of oversight. And that's a key problem. It's called health technology assessment, where you have an independent governmental or quasi-governmental body 
that assesses all the available data and compares new therapies to previously available therapies and makes recommendations for doctors and coverage and so forth about the rational use of drugs. We don't do that. So our Wild West mentality of allowing however much direct-to-consumer advertising you want and letting the drug companies charge 3.5, three and a half times more for brand name drugs than the citizens of other uh, OECD countries, we have this system where we are enormously rewarding aggressive marketing of drugs that are no better than previously available drugs, whereas the other countries are evaluating the effectiveness and the uh, cost of the new drugs so that they spend their money rationally. So New Zealand and the U.S. are the only two countries that allow direct-to-consumer advertising. We have by far the highest drug spending per capita. New Zealand has the lowest drug, capita, lowest drug spending per capita. So you certainly can't draw a causal relationship just based on whether direct-to-consumer advertising is allowed or not. It's the context into which it's allowed that makes the difference. Yeah, this this seems like one of those things that once the money is in the system, it's just super freaking hard to take it out of the system. And I don't just mean the ad dollars on television, but the fact that they are able to spend so much money on national advertising campaigns. I mean, I know what a national ad campaign costs just on this podcast. So when you're running ads for, let's, that we were joking around pre-show, like P dru bl bladder drugs for men, when you're running those 50 times an hour on you know, news channels that are national, this is hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising, if not billions. Right. And, and, but again, we need to expand this because we're talking about marketing as advertising. Right. But we've got to think about the drug company marketing as everything from deciding their research agenda, deciding how they're going to uh, set up studies, who's going to control the analysis of the studies. Publications in uh, medical journals are treated as if they're marketing material by the drug companies. Not by the doctors. The doctors think that's evidence-based medicine, and if it's peer-reviewed, uh, that means that it's accurate and, and that should guide their practicing. The doctors do not understand that the peer reviewers don't have access to the data from the clinical trials, 86% of which are sponsored by the drug companies. The drug companies have one primary mission. We've got to remember this. Their mission is to maximize their profits and refer uh, and and um, and deliver those profits to their shareholders and investors. That's their job. It's not to make us healthier. It's not to improve the quality of our lives. It's to maximize the financial returns to their investors, and they do it very well. Yeah, this uh, the advertising on TV. It's. <laughs> People probably would say, well, what about cigarettes and alcohol? You can't advertise those on TV. And I looked this up because I was like, oh, yeah, the, you know, as a lawyer, I'm like, why is that? Well, there's some one, it's free speech. You can sort of advertise almost anything you want. But they banned alcohol and cigarettes saying there's absolutely no I mean, these are vices, right? There's no therapeutic benefit from it. It really no one's going to argue. Well, at least not now. Finally, it, no one's going to argue that these things are have any other benefit other than it's something that you shouldn't do, but that humans like because of the way that our, our brains are wired. Whereas these drugs, they argue, hey, look, these have therapeutic benefits. You can't block us from advertising it. It's a breach of our, our civil rights, essentially, <laughs> our free speech, right to free speech. And I get that argument, you know, from a legal perspective, but man, is that a slippery slope. Well, Jordan, we, we, let's just look at the context of it, because I, I've spoken, I agree with your analysis. My underst I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding from good lawyers is exactly what you say. And furthermore, that the United States Constitution is different than the constitutions in other countries, and that probably the right to advertise drugs is, uh, by a reasonable analysis, baked into our Constitution. I can accept that. But but we pretend that we're, the FDA pretends it's overseeing the information that's delivered in those advertisements by making sure it conforms with certain, the, the ads conform with certain regulations. What they're not doing is making sure that they leave viewers with an accurate impression 
of the benefit they'll derive from the drug, how many people have to be treated for one to improve, whether lifestyle uh, modification will do as well or better than the drug, and how much the drug actually costs. Uh, not just the copay, which they're very happy to tell you is very low, mm -hmm. but the total cost of the drug so that you'll know what the impact of your use of that drug is going to be on all of our insurance premiums and taxes uh, in the future. So the, the advertisements could be um, uh, the regulations for the advertisements could easily be drawn up to say, okay, we're stuck with this. I mean, I think you and I would agree that we'd be better off without it, but we're stuck with it. But you could have advertisements that, for example, if you're, uh, Humira was the most advertised drug for many years. It's what does been, that one do? So, or it, what's it um, supposed to do anyway? It's primarily for rheumatoid arthritis, but it has eight other indications. Okay. It's a, it, it's a, um, um, it decreases the level of inflammation in the body. Okay. Um, and it's very expensive. It costs like $70,000 a year. Oh. Um, it used to be very inexpensive, like only $20,000 a year, but they became the biggest advertiser and they raised their prices year by year as their advertising became more successful. So it's been for many years the best-selling drug in the United States and in the world. Um, now it's replaced by the COVID vaccines. But the primary use of Humira, at least originally, was for rheumatoid arthritis, and that's the way most people know it. Um, now, when you look, at, and it's advertised for, for rheumatoid arthritis. Now, if you look at the th first-line drug therapy for rheumatoid arthritis, there's one chart in the FDA label that actually compares Humira alone to methotrexate alone, an older anti-inflammatory drug. And what it shows <clears throat> is that despite the fact that Humira costs about $72,000 a year and methotrexate costs about $480 a year, and they seem to have the same number of side effects, that methotrexate is not inferior, in fact, is slightly better, not statistically significantly better, but slightly better than Humira. <laughs> so the one that's 15 is... times cheaper is actually a little bit better. No, no, it's not 15 times. It's 150 times. Oh, sorry. Let me let me redo that because I don't want to sound like an idiot. I just did it in my head. Um, wait, you said $480 a year versus 70,000? 72,000. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the, <laughs> the, now you know why I freaking took... Uh, no, you should leave it math. in. Come on, be be humble. Leave it in and, and show people that how how unimaginable it is. <laughs> <laughs> I just sound like a moron, though. I did it in my head, and I was like, that's too much. It's got to be yeah. it dropped to zero. Um, Try it. Try leaving the whole conversation in. We'll I think see. people will appreciate your humanity. Mm. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. I'm probably just going to get 10,000 emails about how I can't do math. Um, there's a rule about not doing math in public. I don't know if you've heard it. This is why. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so the, other, the idea that there's something that can be so much more cost-effective and do the same thing or maybe be better at doing that same thing is, I mean, it's, it's what the conspiracy folks say about a lot of drugs, man. You know, I'm not gonna, not gonna lie. It's like, this is where the, this is where the rubber meets the road. And we think, well, wait a minute, maybe these companies are being a little bit misleading and try just doing it to try and make money. And I know from your book that that there's a lot of that. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the voiceovers on the ads, right, where people are dancing with their grandkids and having fun while the voiceover guy talks about how it might kill you in a hundred different ways and it makes you suicidal. I mean, this is actually almost like they're innovating for the purpose of just having something new that they can charge more money for. Okay, let's stop there. Innovation is used by biotech to imply that we are providing more effective healthcare all the time that is leading to more effective, more to better health for Americans. That's not what innovation means. Innovation means it's a business concept, and it means that currently used products are replaced with more expensive products and more profitable products. And we've got to get over this notion that somehow we know pharmaceutical companies are greedy and sometimes they lie, but they really can't really be fundamentally just interested in their own money. And that's what we've got to get over. That's their job. That's what they do. They do it. They are world class. 
And until we Americans are willing to be honest about this simple fact, we're not going to try to put guardrails back on this system that the United States is unique in not having, guardrails that mean that the drug companies have to tell the truth and that they uh, subject uh, their data to independent analysis so doctors uh, can know what the best therapies are. They don't do that, and they fight tooth and nail against it. And as you were saying, the wealthier they get, and they're pretty damn wealthy right now, the more money they have to fight anything that's going to threaten their profits. Right, because they can throw money into lobbying. And I, th I think it was something you'd said in another piece where the pharma lobby is something, th when you do the math, it ends up, which I will not do in public, ends up being like $500,000 per member of Congress they're spending on lobbying. Yeah, Did I get that yeah, right? It's, it's somewhere close to that. I mean, that's, th and, and imagine that spend. Yeah, and it's it's bipartisan. I was looking at the uh, 2020 election cycle drug spending, and eight out of the 10 recipients were Democrats. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I want to point to one side, but I think it is important to say both because it's really easy for people on one side of the aisle to say, well, it's the other guys doing that. Right, and it's a political theater that is dedicated to not accomplishing meaningful reform. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I don't, I don't, this shows it sort of decidedly non-political. Some stuff falls into po politics because it always has to, you know, there's, you can't really avoid it. But I, I try not to be like, can you see what the Republican, Democrat, are, you know, independent, because it doesn't do anything. All that does is, is do the tribal thing, which we're, we have way too much of right now. Um, because we end up fighting with each other instead of saying, wait, why are we letting pharma companies spend half a million dollars per member of Congress so that we get bad drugs that cost way more and end up killing us? Uh, I, I want to highlight something, though. Most doctors, right, are just trying to be good doctors. But is it that they're naive to the power and nonsense that drug companies pull or, or what? Because it seems like drug companies have essentially just hijacked evidence-based medicine. Drug companies have hijacked evidence-based medicine. And um, the doctors, almost all the doctors, are trying to do their best for their patients and are sincerely committed to their life mission of helping their patients to live the healthiest lives they can. Um, I've been on the hot seat. I was a family doc in private practice for 20 years. I know how the medical community works. Almost everyone's trying to do the right thing. So the, but the problem is that they're being fed bad information. And it's so deep that when you say, and you're correct, I'm not being critical of what you're saying, but when you say, aren't most doctors committed to practicing evidence-based medicine? Mm -hmm. Well, the definition of evidence-based medicine is that they're reading their journals, the peer-reviewed journals, and they're um, looking at the quality of the trials. They got a little bit of knowledge about uh, research techniques and so forth. And the, the, the trials look like they're high quality and they're peer-reviewed. And so you can read those and you can integrate that in your prescribing habits. And then you look at the guidelines that are published um, by experts, and those become fairly clear-cut about how you should practice medicine, and that good doctors, we say, are practicing evidence-based medicine because they, they follow both of uh, those sources of information. Here's the problem, Jordan. The drug companies have paid for the research. The drug companies have analyzed the research. The drug companies have written up most of the research, they sub these written up manuscripts that are brief summaries of the whole study are then submitted to journals for publication. When they're submitted to journals and the peer reviewers and the medical journal editors look at these manuscripts, they don't get to see the underlying data. They peer don't get to see the data. They don't get to see the data. I, I can't say that any more clearly. That is, I'm just, I'm highlighting that because it makes, it, it, it's like, that's like the first thing, look, I, again, never do math in public, but my math teacher was like, show your work, right? Because I want to know how you arrived to this conclusion. But instead, it sounds like the drug company pays for research, their people do the research, they own all the data, and then they say, here's our conclusion, and the peer reviewer goes, yep, looks good, and then puts it in a journal. I mean, there's got to be a little more to it, but that's kind of, that's what it sounds like you're telling me right now. That's pretty much it. And then what happens because uh, the evidence-based medicine movement has moved along because initially they said all docs should learn how to read journals and should know research 
uh, techniques and analysis and should make the decisions for themselves. But there's so much information that doctors can't possibly do that, and you need a, at least a master's in public health to do it anyway. So the evidence-based medicine people said, okay, we'll, we, we see that this is too much of a burden for practicing physicians, and we'll just get them the good guidelines, and we'll let them follow the guidelines, because the guidelines will have done that work for them, and they can just follow the guidelines. That's a good system. But the problem is that the guidelines are a compendium of the studies that have been published that have not been peer-reviewed, and the people who write the guidelines don't have access to the underlying data. I just can't believe, I mean, I believe you, right? But I just can't, I'm in shock that they can't look at the data. So if you want to challenge something, you just can't because, and it's so easy to mess around with this and hide the ball because you don't have the data. No one can say, hey, you analyzed this wrong because they just have no basis to do that. Correct. Now, occasionally a really good peer reviewer or a really good medical journal editor will say, hey, that's not clear. Will you send me some data to back that up or something? So it's not that that can't happen in private communication. But it doesn't happen. I assume in the, in the real world. The, the temptation then is for these companies, and I'm not accusing anyone of anything, but the temptation certainly would be to manipulate the data to get the conclusion that you want for a new drug that you just spend a billion dollars creating. That, that's exactly right. And I, you're a lawyer. Yeah. I spent 10 years in litigation as an expert, uh, uh, as an expert witness. Mm -hmm. I've seen what's in the corporate computers. There's usually about 20 million documents per case in litigation. Literally, huh? Yeah, literally. Yeah. And I could query anything about those 20 million documents. It's like a kid in a toy shop. So I could ask any question of the data and the, um, you know, the lawyer geeks who've got it, the, the uh, spreadsheets and the database all set will give me the documents. And if it gets too complicated for me as a, um, as a family doc who did two years of a research fellowship, um, the lawyers hire PhD um, uh, statisticians and epidemiologists wow. and so forth to work with. So I know what's in the data. And I can tell you that it often doesn't represent what's going on. For example, I was in civil litigation with a drug called Bextra. It, it was like Vioxx. It's an anti-inflammatory drug that really provided no better pain relief and supposedly was gentle around the stomach, but that's a dubious claim. So I was in, and there was a little bit of a cardiovascular issue. So I was in the civil litigation that came after Vioxx litigation. I was in that too, but the Bextra litigation was after, it was much smaller. Um, there were 8,000 plaintiffs who uh, alleged cardiovascular injury due to Bextra in you, that you, litigation. You said a little bit of a cardiovascular, I don't mean to laugh at this, a little bit of a cardiovascular issue sounds like, can that, can there, is there a such thing as a little bit of a cardio, like there's the, a little problem with your heart, nothing to worry about, except for that no, it might kill you. There's no such thing as a little bit of, uh, of heart problem, but right. there is such a thing as an expert signing a protective order and not being able to talk about what he knows. <laughs> Got it. Okay. <laughs> Understood. Okay. okay. So I did the civil litigation, and the the uh, case settled. The 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 award to the eight thousand plaintiffs was settled, and it's secret, and nobody can talk about it. And I don't know what it, what the what it was, though I know what the parameters of these kinds of settlements are. But I felt that the company had not behaved in a way that represented scientific values, that honored scientific values. That, that was my feeling. And I got in touch with the Department of Justice to uh, share that feeling without sharing any confidential information. And one thing led to another, and they soon sent me a federal subpoena, like the January 6th Mm -hmm. is sending out federal, it means a big deal. You know, a guy drives up in the car and says, you must appear at the FBI headquarters and the Department of Justice will be there and you must bring your computer and so forth. So I go and I, I as, as an expert in civil litigation, I had spent a lot of time figuring out 
what I thought had happened and wrote a report about what I thought had happened. And I shared all that information and, and the FBI folks who were there and the DOJ folks that were there were incredibly impressive people. Uh, many of them knew a lot about this case. They were thinking hard. They were questioning me as hard. They were pushing me as hard as a good defense attorney pushes me in deposition to uh, kind of, you know, kick my tires and make sure that I knew what I was talking about. They did a good job. And six months later, they don't, they keep their cards very close to their chest. And sure. I didn't hear any follow-up. Yeah, the FBI is not going to keep you posted on their investigation, generally. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So six months later, I read in the paper that Pfizer had been slapped with the largest criminal fine in U.S. history for what they had done wow. with Extra. Wow. $1.195 billion. <laughs> wow. And, and But unfortunately, that's like, they can chalk that up to the cost of, they can chalk that up to the cost of doing business, I would assume, at some point. Uh, that one's close, and Vioxx was close. But nobody went to jail, nobody, yeah. they didn't lose money, you know. So e even when they blow it completely, except maybe for the Sacklers, though that's not over yet, uh, but even when they blow it completely with a disaster like Vioxx that killed forty to 60,000 Americans, even then, wow. they break even. And no, nobody went to jail about that. Either. That's cr forty to sixty thousand. Let's talk about that for a second. I mean, how yeah, many people died? That's a little bit in, of cardiovascular trouble. That's a slow, that's some cardiovascular trouble. That that's isn't that more people? How many people died in Vietnam? Do you happen to know? Vietnam is fifty eight thousand. Yeah. So it's it's that level of magnitude. Unbelievable. How does something like that happen? That's so massive in scale. That's not like thirteen plaintiffs that have suffered a rare condition that should have been caught, or like that's not even. 150 plaintiffs that had suffered from something that was sort of rare or, or I mean, this is a humongous number of people. That's like the number of people that would get prescribed a drug for some, something and, and they died. Like th this drug must have been everywhere and it must have killed a very significant number of its users. Well, uh, maybe not because 25 million Americans used it. That it was the most heavily advertised drug and, Still, and it was though, claimed. 60,000 yeah, is no, it, I mean, that's not. It's huge. It's a huge number it's of huge. people. It's huge. We spend gazillions of dollars prescribing drugs that have nowhere near uh, the benefit that Vioxx caused harm. Now, let me make a shameless plug and say this story is in chapter one of my book. Yeah. This, this is where I open the book. And you say, how did it happen? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you how it happened. Merck developed this drug, Vioxx that they hoped would cause fewer GI symptoms and provide the same equal uh, relief for arthritis and pain as less expensive uh, um, anti-inflammatory drugs, um, ibuprofen and naproxen relief. So they hoped that would happen. They knew theoretically that it was possible that there would be an effect on the blood clotting system that could tip things towards clotting. They understood that. They ran this study called the VIGOR trial to see if Vioxx reduced the risk of serious GI complications. And But they did follow this, the cardiovascular safety data, but they did a little trick. They stopped collecting cardiovascular events a month before the trial ended so that the number of excess heart attacks that were caused by Vioxx were reported in the New England Journal, which had peer-reviewed the article but didn't have the data, they and the medical editors, the journal editors didn't have the data. They reported in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine that Vioxx did not significantly in increase the risk of heart attacks. They reported that. Three months after they reported it, the FDA's analysis of the data from Merck was published. There was an advisory committee meeting, and this data became available on the web. It was really hard to find, but you could find it if you knew it was there. So I went at it, and I found that the FDA knew, knew that there were three heart attacks that occurred during the scheduled duration of the study that hadn't been reported. They knew that. And not only that, the, the Merck had reported heart attacks but the endpoint wasn't just heart attacks, it was heart attacks, strokes, and blood clots 
because those are all related to blood clotting and you get more events so you can find trouble earlier. And it turned out that in the FDA's analysis of that study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, it showed that the risk of serious heart attack, strokes, and blood clots more than doubled in the group that was treated with Vioxx, more than doubled. Mm. So the New England Journal editors now knew that that was the fact, that they had been bamboozled. And I, I don't think they were in on a conspiracy. I think right. they were just straight bamboozled. Yeah, they were they, duped. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's the way it goes. I remember I was saying sometimes they ask for more data, but it never happens. That mm -hmm. was a it never happens time. Um, so, so the New England Journal of Medicine editors find out about the FDA data, and they now know that they've published an article that doesn't even report the overall cardiovascular risk of Vioxx and that, and that it doubled the risk of serious blood clotting events. The, the editors know that, but they continue to sell reprints of their article to Merck, and they sell a total, this is, they know that in early in 2001, and they continue to sell reprints right through 2004 until Vioxx was pulled. Wait, the journal but, sold the reprints knowing that this was not accurate to, to why? To generate revenue? No. Uh, yes. Choose, choose another answer. Uh, I mean. Yes. That's un yes. I'm trying to think of any sort of reasonable. Re no, no, no. And and this is, was all unfolding. Um, there's this guy, a wonderful guy named Richard Smith, who was editor in chief of the British Medical Journal for 13 years and had worked with the British Medical Journal 12 years before that. He, he knew what was going on. And after he steps it down, he, he wrote an article in his blog and he said, I finally understand what's going on. And this is part of your question about how the hell could journals publish peer-reviewed articles when the peer reviewers don't have data. Richard Smith writes, I finally understand what's going on. A significant portion of the most prestigious journal's income comes from the sale of reprints. So in 2005, maybe the last year when data was available, but The Lancet, which is almost as prestigious as the New England Journal. It's in the UK, so it's not quite as much of a presence here in the United States. But 41% of the Lancet's income came from reprint sales. And the New England Journal and JAMA wouldn't release their data. Oh, 41%. 41%. That is so insane. That's, I just can't, it's really shocking it's like selling, because it, look, we think, okay, it's an article, but this is like, you might as well be selling a drug that is contaminated because you're give, you're doing essentially, almost this, essentially the same thing. It's and you're probably just, worse. It's worse. It's probably yeah, worse. Yeah, it's worse actually, because you're misleading doctors using it, right? So you're actually and industrializing it. you know it's it. actively harmful, whatever the right. drug is. And instead of saying, hey, you know what, we can't do this, you're going, yeah, but our revenue might go down and then I might get asked to leave my position here. Is it exactly, exactly. Unbelievable. So, okay, but it's worse. It's worse because what happens is that there's essentially an editorial kickback system where the journals want to attract the articles that they can sell the most reprints of. So they want the drug companies to submit their commercially important articles to the big journals. And there's a real incentive for the journals not to kick the tires too hard. So when you say, how the hell can, you say, Abramson, you are telling me such a crazy story yeah. about the best medical journals in the world not requiring their peer, review, peer reviewers to have data and knowing that it's going on. And what I say to you is, not only is it going on, but the, um, the fact that it's going on um, distorts the knowledge that is communicated between the doctors, between the journals and the doctors. Right. Towards the kinds of information that will sell reprints. Oh, so it's just a self, or what do you call it? Like a, it's a vicious cycle, but it's worse. I'm trying to think of another term for this. A market failure. Yeah, it's a market failure. What an, I call it. Epic That's chapter eight in the book. Yeah. yeah. 
No, it's just a straight market failure where yeah. the journals are in on it, the professional, the doctors' professional societies are in on it, the academic medical centers are in on it, the academic researchers are in on it, the um, the nonprofit organizations like the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association are in on it because they're taking funding from their nonprofit, but they're taking funding for the from the for-profit companies. So it's this entire nexus of market failure that is designed for each of the players to extract as much money as they can. And the public gets screwed and the doctors get screwed because they're getting bad information right. and they're trying to help their patients and be learned intermediaries. And they are trained not to understand that they are unlearned intermediaries. That's what I, w I wanted to highlight, that the doctors were not one of the people you said was in on it. In fact, they're getting duped by this as well, which is awful because this is... So you can trust your doctor. The problem is your doctor can't really trust the information that he's getting because it's No, all... the problem is your doctor does trust the information. R right, but he, but he can't. He shouldn't. He shouldn't, but right. he does. Yeah. Yeah, but it, he he's can't trust the information. To, he's, he's been taught to trust that he must trust the information, right. that he will not, or she, will not be a good doctor if he or she does not trust that information and practice, this is where our conversation started, evidence-based medicine. Oh, man. And for things like this Vioxx with 60,000 deaths, nobody goes to jail. It reminds me of when I worked on Wall Street in 2006, 2007, 2008, and where the investment banks, which were our clients, you know, they start going under. And we thought, I remember this conversation in the office where I said, man, people are going to get locked up for this. You know, we all saw some of the, some, we smelled something rotten in Denmark. Now it's all coming down. And then they all got bonuses and retired rich or switched jobs and went con consulting. And I was like, I got to get out of here. This is just rotten to the core. And unfortunately, it was a cue for other people to stay in or get in because they knew th they, that was the signal that they were never going to get in trouble for right, their shenanigans. Right. Right. The Wall Street Journal, I, I worked with the Wall Street Journal uh, writers back in 2004. I, um, I published a book in 2004, Overdosed America, and a week after it was published, Viax was pulled off the market. Not because of what I said about Viax, but because I had shown that it was a problem and that they couldn't deny it was a problem. So I became the man, and I, I was all over TV, and and uh, it... it um, I, I could just, you could see how this was my kind of baptism by fire about how, how all this is happening. Hey, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, check out the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There's a lot more just like this. You can find the Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the show. You mentioned at the top of the show, most studies are not done by academics anymore, but by drug companies. At least I think you said something to that effect, right? And the academics, they don't get the results or the data that they do for the study. And I would imagine that even when drug companies bring in outside experts, people who, and, and then don't give them the data, they probably don't want to put up a stink, right? Because they don't want to go, well, if I argue and I try and say that I want the data and yada, yada, they're just not going to work with me anymore. That's exactly right. And we know what's happening. There's, there are good articles that explain what's happening. <clears throat> so in 1991, 80% of the drug company's clinical trials were done by academic medical centers. The drug company would turn it over to the academic medical center, let them participate or completely design the study and the doses and find the patients and collect the numbers and do the analyses and write it up. 1991, 80%. That went down so fast into commercial hands that by 2004, only 26% of the drug company studies were being done by academic medical centers, and the rest were being done by for-profit contract research organizations <clears throat> that um, were hired by the drug companies. So, the, the academic medical centers are now hurting because they've lost a lot of their income from clinical trials because it's gone to these contract research organizations. So they, but they're still doing 26% of the, of the studies in, in 2004. So there's this wonderful article that was published in the New England Journal, to give the New England Journal credit where credit's due. They published this article that examines the terms of the contracts between the drug companies and the academic medical centers on these 26% of studies that 
are still done by academic medical centers. And they find that 80% of those contracts between the drug companies and the academic medical centers, 80% of those contracts say that the drug company will own the data, own the data. And 50% of those contracts say that the drug company will write up and submit the results of the study for publication and it will be shown to the academic non-drug company employed authors. It will be shown to them and they can suggest revisions, but that's all they can do. Oh my God. I mean, so we just have to take their word for it. I mean, this just absolutely begs for companies to manipulate or defraud the public. Or I mean, is it, is it going too far to say that manipulation of data is almost a, it's just a part of the business model? Is that going too far? No. No, and I mean, that's, that was my job in litigation was to get to that point, but the cases were always settled. And, and, and you ask, uh, uh, I haven't actually talked about this in, in public, but it's in the book, and I think it's time to start talking about it. You, you asked about, well, why aren't the students catching on to this ruse? Why are they buying this? So Vioxx was pulled shortly after my book came out. And I teach at Harvard, and the Harvard students asked me to give a lecture and explain what happened with Vioxx. So I gave a lecture, and I told them what I've told your audience right, so far, that, 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 the, that, that the New England Journal had been fooled, and that their article was not correct, and that Vioxx is a dangerous drug, and that after the New England Journal of Medicine understood that they had been fooled when they saw the FDA's analysis of the complete data set, they continued to sell reprints. So I got a phone call, I forget, a week, two weeks, whatever, later. <clears throat> and the voice on the other end of the phone said, hi, I'm the executive assistant, or whatever the position was called, of the editor-in-chief of the New England Journal. And I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> you know, maybe they want an article from me to, you know, Oh, I'm sure happened. he's thrilled with you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, he was thrilled. <laughs> he was thrilled. So, so the executive assistant says, uh, we know you're going to be giving a continuing medical education lecture uh, on March whatever in 2005, and, um, and you're going to be done at 11. So Dr. Drazen wants you in his office at 11 o'clock. And I said, well, you know, 11's a little tight and people like to talk. Uh, how about if we do it at 11.30? Okay, 11.30. So I walk over to the library. The New England Journal's office is in the library of the Harvard Medical School. So I walk over to uh, the Countway Library and I take the elevator up to the top and get ushered very quickly into Dr. Drazen's private office. And it's an elegant office and it's got travel artifacts and it's nice and neat and looks exactly the way you'd expect it to. And he chit chats for a minute and then suddenly jumps into the what he, what's on his mind, which is, how do you think I feel when I'm making rounds with medical students and they tell me you're criticizing the New England Journal of Medicine? This is the most powerful, probably the most powerful doctor in the world, is saying to me, an instructor in primary care at Harvard Medical School, how do you think I feel when medical students say that I, John Abramson, you, John Abramson, are criticizing the New England Journal? And I say to him, I can't, I'm not a mind reader, I can't tell you how you feel, but I can tell you that I thought the purpose of our professional activity was to get to the truth of science and bring that to the people. And that includes informing medical students about what's going on. He didn't see it that way. That We didn't agree. We spent about an hour together. We did not agree. I mean, what, what's that quote where it's like, it's impossible to get somebody to see something if their paycheck is contingent upon them? <laughs> feeling yeah. or otherwise. I, I'm, I know I'm butchering this Sinclair quote. I, I should find it. But. Yeah, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty close. But, but it's even more impossible because it's not just a paycheck. It's his whole existential. It's the, it's the existential platform that he stands upon uh, proclaiming he's the greatest doctor in the world. Uh, that, that's a little overstated. I take that back. Uh, he doesn't say that. But it is the existential platform that he stands on that holds him as one of the most respected doctors in the world. 
Right. The, the quote, by the way, is it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. And in this case, prestige, just substitute prestige or position or status for salary. And it's the same concept. Correct. It, it, you know, Lyndon Johnson said that much more eloquently. Lyndon Johnson said, when you have them by their balls, their hearts and minds follow. It seems, look, it seems like people join drug companies and journals and medical schools and things like that, right, in order to help other people. Sure, there are some business people that are out for profit only, but it seems bizarre to me that we have these companies that are founded and run by people that want to help others, but then we have these disastrous outcomes uh, it sounds like I did an episode with someone named Brian Class where we talked about corrupt systems corrupting people uh, who join these mm -hmm. systems, right? Whether it's yep. the police or the government in a state in India or whatever. In, yep. in other words, maybe the people at the top are motivated by, by profit and they're they're playing by different rules. And those rules actually end up changing the outcome that we see on the surface, right? So if you join as a research scientist or a journal reviewer, but then... The people at the top are like, yeah, 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 but we're trying to make a billion dollars so I can get a hundred million dollar bonus. That just changes the that changes the whole system, and you sort of end up falling into that system. Because I'm trying to rationalize people going to work at these companies and thinking I want to help people who have myocarditis, you know, survive because I've got all these skills and I'm going to research new drugs. And then it comes yes. out that they just end up murdering sixty thousand people through negligence or or deliberate acts of misconduct. Well, those people don't. Um, the um, Wall Street Journal, I started this story before and then I interrupted myself. So the Wall Street Journal was writing about Vioxx and they were doing a very good job writing about Vioxx. And they got in touch with me because I had written the last book about it. And, and um, they uh, published an email from Merck's president of research, I believe it was president of research, I'm not 100% sure, but a, 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 a scientific, science, scientist executive in Merck, that he looked at the data first from that study that showed that there was a, more than a doubling of uh, the incidence of serious cardiovascular events with Vioxx. He looked at that data on March 9th, 2000, when the study was finished and opened up, and he said, it's a shame that the cardiovascular events are there. They appear to be a class effect, but the drugs will do well and we will do well. And we will do uh, well. I mean, how do you, there's only one way you can really interpret that one. Yeah. And he did not go to jail. He's a very prestigious scientist. Oh man, that's hard to hear. Really, it is. I mean, it's, you know, it's it's easy to go like, OK, they got these drug reps and they're using influence to get people to prescribe drugs. And it's not a bribe. It's a little more subtle. You know, great sales is not a crime. But it just when you put all these things together, it just starts to become more and more obvious why so many well-meaning doctors prescribed so much frickin Oxycontin, for example. Yeah. Yeah. They're just trained to believe what the marketing people say. The, what happens is I, I have a diagram in the book and in, in the second chapter, which is the Neurontin litigation, where I had to, I don't talk about excusing myself. Is that uh, the Alzheimer's drug? Is that, or is that no, something? No, 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 it's an old drug. It's an older drug. But um, <clears throat> I, I lost my train of thought here. I need the Alzheimer's drug. <laughs> uh, <It's> okay. <laughs> uh, no, so in the, uh, in the Neurontin trial, uh, we showed a slide that showed how the drug companies develop key messages. So the marketing people do um, do these uh, groups, opinion groups, focus groups, to find out what messages would get the consumers or the doctors to either want to use or want to prescribe the drug. They find that out, independent of what the science shows. So we're not asking, does the science show that the drug does that? We're saying, what messages would improve our drug sales if we propagate those messages? And then they show a nice chart where they have results from a clinical trial. And if they don't put their clinical trial results through a filter that only lets the key messages come out the other side, then they will develop discordance 
between what's published in the medical journals and what their marketing messages are. And that's bad for sales and they don't want that to happen. So the, the company, the medical communications company is teaching Pfizer how to make sure their message is unified by running all the data through that filter first time around. That's what got Pfizer that's what got the jury to find Pfizer guilty of fraud and racketeering violations. And, and racketeering, for people who are like, wait, I've heard of that. Yes, that's what they use when they prosecute mafia gangsters, right? They use RICO, which is Correct. an anti-mafia statute that we have in the United States where damages are tripled. And exactly. you can get people who are normally would be too tangential to a crime. You can nail those folks and get them to flip or put them in prison due to the RICO statute. And it's used. It was used. It was like the design was let's take down the Italian mafia and we need different laws to do it. Right. And that's we, exactly right. Now, in, in the in the Neurontin case with Pfizer, the uh, the RICO charges, the 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 entities that were involved in the RICO enterprise were brought in, the, the, their work product was brought in. And that uh, the chart that I was just telling you about, about key messages, making sure that the clinical trial results were run through a filter of key messages. That company was in as part of the RICO enterprise, but it wasn't, they didn't go after them. So they weren't named as RICO co-conspirators. It was just Pfizer that was named as the RICO conspirator. It's just insane, though. Like, even in, in the fine that they got was less than, a, is it true that it was like less than a year of the profit they got from selling the drug they lied about? Yeah. I mean, that's, it's, this is basically like a true conspiracy theory. Uh, I'm not one of those guys, but it's really hard. It's, you know, when it, when you look at things th things like this, and they're using conspiracy statutes like and racketeering statutes like RICO to go after a drug company, it's really hard not to get my tinfoil hat, uh, start folding up my tinfoil hat. Well, let's let's separate it out. Um, it, it's close to a conspiracy theory, but it's a it's a following the financial incentives. And the people around them, there is this nexus around them that is also following their financial incentives, the medical marketing company or academic researchers or the journal editors who aren't insisting upon uh, complete transparency. They're following their economic um, benefit. So I, I would replace conspiracy, which sort of has yeah, it's the got a, it's aura got a uh, of e stigma of, attached to it. It's yeah. Well, it's a stigma. Yeah, <laughs> really. They they need a PR. Yeah, console. they need to rebrand that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. No, no, no. But conspiracy sort of implies a nonsensical uh, misinformation, a and this isn't nonsensical at all. This is just totally disciplined and purposeful. If I'm a doctor, how do I see through drug company nonsense and make better care recommendations for my patients? I mean, that's probably a whole show, but do you have some thoughts on that kind of thing? Because if I can't trust the medical journals that I'm supposed to read, what the hell else am I supposed to do? Do I have any other options? Well, yes, there are some options, but first we got to understand how bad it is. I mean, it's like a dentist drilling out a cavity if you don't get to the bottom. Uh, so l let me just finish my story about cl clinical practice guidelines. So the docs are told to, to follow the clinical practice guidelines, and there's a lot of conflicts of interest amongst the people who are the chairs and vice chairs of the guideline panels and the worker bees in the, in the guideline panels. And there's conflicts of interest with the sponsors of the um, guidelines, like the American Heart Association or the American Diabetes Association. They take money from drug companies. So there's a lot of conflicts of interest around. So the National um, Academy of Medicine, used to be called the Institute of Medicine, got interested in this issue, and they made guidelines for guidelines about conflicts of interest and uh, the separation of money interests and academic interests. They didn't go after the data, but they made pretty good recommendations. So within the government, the Agency for Healthcare Quality research, I think, set up a national clearinghouse for guidelines. <clears throat> I think they set it up in 2017. And it was a very good site. Uh, 200,000 people were going there each month to get information about what the guidelines are for the particular issue that they're dealing with, doctors and patients. And um, <clears throat> the national clearinghouse went one step further 
And they implemented a policy to write at the top of the guideline page the extent, a little note that informed readers the extent to which the guideline had, had adhered to the Institute of Medicine's guidelines for guidelines. Does, does that make sense? Uh, maybe. <laughs> well, let me do it again. Yeah, let's do that they, again. Yeah, the Agency for Healthcare Quality Research made a rule. They were running the National Guideline Clearinghouse and they made a rule that at the top of the web page that would present a guideline, they would present an assessment of how much the guideline had complied with the guidelines from the Institute of Medicine about financial conflicts of interest oh. and independence and so forth. Okay. So they would tell the reader, you know, this is, uh, it, was, uh, they, it was called how trustworthy the guideline was. Right, it's like a and score, they would right? A score, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah exactly, okay? So that was, I believe that was implemented in 2017. In the middle of 2018, the website went dark. Zero funded, gone, disappeared. <laughs> okay, yeah. Surprise, surprise, I suppose, right? Well, you, you hope you hit a bottom at some point, but that wasn't it. Jeez. We don't want the score because the scores on our stuff isn't going to be good, so let's just defund the scorers. Precisely. Unfrickin' believable. I mean, it's, ah, it's so awful. It, look, this, this brings up uncomfortable questions, right? Like, how do we trust vaccine info and trials then? And I'm not an anti-vax guy at all. I'm quite the opposite, but I'm like, you know, I, I'm starting to understand why people uh, distrust drug companies, and it makes me, you know, I'm vaxxed and boosted, but now I'm supposed to give that to my kids too? It's a little nerve-wracking when you hear stuff like this, right? That's exactly right. And the, the vaccine, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. The uh, vaccination is enormously important. Vaccination, um... By July uh, twenty June twenty twenty one, the t the date at which all Americans adults could have been vaccinated if they wanted to be vaccinated, the vaccines had saved a million American lives. The vaccines are hugely important, and the vaccine companies are hoarding their vaccines to sell to wealthy countries. So that now low-income countries have a 12% vaccination rate, and the World Health Organization has said that it had to be a 60% vaccination rate, or we're going to keep getting hit with these uh, variants, and it's 12%. Ugh, so right. we got more variants coming, and while the drug companies, this is the kind of complexity of understanding the, how bad the drug companies are, and yet how good medical science can be. So they're making a great vaccine. But because they're leaving the uh, underdeveloped world unvaccinated, they're virtually assuring that these uh, variants will keep coming back to us Americans who are vaccinated and will evade our immunity at some point, and we're going to be back starting all over again. So because they're grabbing so much money out of this and are so intent on just selling as much drug as they can to the countries that can pay retail, they're going to leave us exposed to the risk of the variants that are going to ricochet back. Well, and why it's not? A problem. They're, they're selling us the booster, too. So it's actually a win-win for them at that rate. Is it not? It is a win-win. And that's the key issue. The, the key issue is that they are doing their job. Government is not doing its job. Their job is to make as much money as they can. The CEO of Moderna is now worth about $5.3 billion. 100% or approximately 100% of the development costs of Moderna's vaccine was, were footed by the uh, United States government. And the, and the CEO is worth $5.3 billion, while the third world is un under way, way wicked under wicked and dangerously under-vaccinated. But they are doing their job. The job of a corporation, at least in the United States, is to maximize its profits. The problem is that we don't have guardrails, that we not only do we have corporations that are just profit-seeking, but we have a government that won't get in and regulate the situation so that the market works to serve the public interest. That's the problem. So to to summarize the the little <laughs> to summarize this I, I'm still like in, I, my jaw is on my desk here 
So taxpayers fund vaccine development for Project Warp Speed. We come up with the mRNA vaccine. So the NIH does most of the work. The pharma companies make 60 to 80 percent profit. I looked this up on the vaccines. Mm -hmm. The government mm -hmm. tolerates this because of lobbying and money and politics. And then we don't use that same miracle of medical science to get the rest of the developing world those vaccines. So now we have an a, a sort of what is it called when it, it's not an epidemic, when it's um, it's something that's always there. I, the word's right on the tip of my tongue, a disease that's always there. So it comes back every year like the flu. What's the word for that? Uh, endemic. Is that the word? <laughs> Pandemic and and endemic, right? Like it just keeps coming back. Yes, yeah, 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 that's correct. So now, endemic. now the virus. So now coronavirus is endemic, but that's okay because they get to sell us the booster too. And all of this is so funded by us as taxpayers. The companies take these big margins, then they misuse the product essentially, so that it doesn't protect us that well, because that will also make them more money and screw all of us. You know, people in developing world who die from this, and people here who have to continue to get more and more drugs pumped into us because we didn't just stamp this thing out. It's really hard not to become a conspiracy theorist when these companies are shipping me my tinfoil hat via FedEx overnight delivery here. Yeah, 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 or same day delivery. Um, you've got it 100% right. Now, but the important message, this is, this is the teachable issue right now, and it goes back to what the hell do we do, doctors and patients. The key message here is not that the vaccine makers are so greedy that they're screwing us and they're making you know tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars that they never thought they'd see, uh, but for their good fortune, the coronavirus came our way. Um, no, the message is that in the United States, all medical science, all, all scientific therapeutics, medical science therapeutics, come through the commercial side. And the commercial side will do everything it can to maximize its financial advantage. And yet there are good products. So in this crazy situation where the variants are going to keep coming back and biting us in the butt because we're not um, making sure that uh, somehow the world works together to get uh, low-income countries vaccinated, we're, we're, we're going to have to deal with COVID for many years, and that's not a good thing. But that doesn't mean that the vaccines don't work when they get put in your body. Mm -hmm. And we've got to be smart about this. I mean, it's it's easy, it's sloppy to just get pissed off and say, oh, it's a friggin' conspiracy right. and they're just out to hurt us and they want to have more COVID and it's all a system and I'm not going to get the vaccine because I'm not being part of this system. That is not a smart way to deal with this very serious situation. We've got to be smarter, not dumber, confronting the, the, this situation. And we've got to understand that all these things wrong with vaccine, and there's more. We haven't talked about the quality of the data, and, and there's plenty more problems. I can We can have two more shows about it. But the bottom line is that the evidence is clear that getting vaccinated and one booster is helpful for adults. And don't deprive yourself of that because these guys are just grabbing money and our government is helping them. That's no reason to deprive yourself of the protection that the vaccine will provide. Thank you for clearing that up, because it's I, I really wanted to be careful not to deliver the wrong message with this episode. But I also really wanted to cover this topic. So you just you just nailed that. And I appreciate that. I want to thank you for that. Um, My pleasure. The cost. Thanks of, for the opportunity. Yeah, of course. No, I, I, I want people to. It, it's hard to educate about these topics because it, it makes people go, well, it's hopeless. And the thing is, now you should just rub uh, essential oils on everything and you'll be fine instead of using modern medicine because it's all a big sham. And that's not it. And so it was I was, you know, I had to get off the fence on this this topic. Uh, but then I read the book and I was like, I have to talk about this because the cost of bad health care in the United States is is obscene as per those charts that will again be linked in the show notes. What did the nations that are doing well with healthcare do differently? We mentioned pharma can't advertise, but we also sort of said, hey, that's not just it. New Zealand, uh, I assume Switzerland is up there because they're always up there with everything. You know, Singapore is probably up there with good healthcare. What do these countries, what do they have that that's so obviously conspicuously missing in the United States. You mentioned guardrails. I assume they have an agency for this or something. Yeah. Yes. It's called health technology assessment. So as part of the government um, 
relationship with healthcare. There's an, there's an institute or an agency that collects the best data available. And sometimes it's not perfect. Sometimes they don't get the uh, original data from the studies, but they do the best they can. And they make recommendations about um, what doctors should prescribe, uh, what, what drugs are going to be effective and um, efficient. Now, I just want to put a placeholder in because we've got to talk about the the misdirection of our healthcare towards expensive therapeutics instead of um, healthy lifestyle. We, yeah, we've got to get to that. Yeah, but I, I was going to throw that in the show close, but we can get to it. Yeah. Okay, but before we get there, okay, I, I want to talk about insulin. the The United States' insulin problem, in from the perspective that you just asked, what are we doing differently? that's causing American healthcare to be so much more expensive and so much less effective. So it, when we look at insulin, I mean, it, it becomes a hot issue because people are really getting hurt um, when they have trouble buying their insulin uh, uh, because of the high prices of the insulin analogs, the latest generation of insulins in the United States. And we do not have health technology assessment. So it turns out that Nine, there's type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetics um, need insulin from <clears throat> the first day of diagnosis, and they'll die if they don't get insulin. But that all, type 1 diabetics only account for about 20% of the insulin that's used in the United States. There are so many more type 2 diabetics than type 1 diabetics that even though a quarter of, only a quarter of type 2 diabetics require insulin, they still use 80% of the insulin that's prescribed in the United States. So now we've got 90% of the type 2 diabetics are using the insulin analogs that cost up to $300 a vial. They're not using the first generation of bioengineered insulin called recombinant human insulin, which can cost $35 a vial, $50 a vial, something like that. So there's a movement now to help patients with their insulin co-pays so that they don't have to pay the high price of the insulin. The government or the insurer will pay. The problem here is that there is no evidence that insulin analogs are better for people with type 2 diabetes than the original bioengineered insulin called recombinant human insulin. There's no evidence that it's superior. It's a fiction. And the American Diabetes Association recommended the expense of insulins until 2018, and the American um, Association of Clinical Endocrinologists recommended it through about 2017 or 18. And all doctors, not all, almost all doctors, believe that insulin analogs provide their patients with better care in the United States. But in England, if you look, you can go to this on the web and look at the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, they say that insulin analogs are not shown to be superior for type 2 diabetes to so start your patients on uh, recombinant human insulin, and you'll save approximately 90%. And so does New Zealand and Canada and Germany. And the countries that have health technology assessment, they're not uh, the companies that have health technology assessment are informing their doctors mm. that the marketing of insulin analogs for type 2 diabetics doesn't make sense and that the first line drug should be recombinant human insulin. Right. The marketing doesn't make sense because it's marketing. So you can safely ignore it in all of most of these cases. And I assume that these agencies, these these health technology assessment agencies also don't allow things like, uh, I read this in your book, health, uh, there's insurance copay managers that will get rebates and like kickback systems going to place drugs on insurance coverage lists, not because they're the best drug for the job, but because they're expensive. So the insurance will cover it, which just distorts the market and leads to less effective treatments, correct? That, that's precisely right. And that's the consequence of not having a guardrail to ensure that doctors have access to accurate information and not marketing-driven information. That's a perfect example of a guardrail that we don't have. 
So if the government spent the money they spend on insulin, the new fancy schmancy, but does the exact same thing, insulin for diabetics, instead, if they spent that money instead on, I don't know, wellness programs, physical fitness to prevent diabetes for the same amount of money, we could cover the entire country. D is that correct or did I misread that? Uh, slightly. It's almost correct. We could provide um, lifestyle programs to all the people at increased risk of diabetes in the United States. You, we could liberate approximately $20 billion a year if we just got to rational use of insulin. And that's with one, two, one drug for one disease, $20 billion. Yes, yes. yes. And, and <clears throat> to go back to your question, this is why it's so expensive. But why are we getting, why are we not getting good health? I mean, it, it, it would make sense if we were wasting money, at least we'd be getting good health, but paying too much for it. But our health is going down. And this is a perfect example because the money to be made here is by peddling insulin analogs to doctors who prescribe for type 2 diabetes when half of diabetes can be prevented by adopting a healthy lifestyle. We know this from a randomized controlled trial. Mm -hmm that was published in the New England Journal in 2002, the Diabetes Prevention Program, that intensive lifestyle counseling that you can provide at your local YMCA prevents half of high-risk pre-diabetics from getting, going on and becoming diabetic. But because there's so much money, we're distorting the allocation of our resources, our national allocation of resources, into developing and then selling these very expensive drugs when Type 2 diabetes is primarily, not entirely, but primarily a consequence of being obese and not living a healthy lifestyle and being poor, to be fair. Mm -hmm. But um, we're not addressing that. There's no financial reward for addressing that. The financial reward is for, for, for manipulating people's minds to think that insulin analogs are going to provide better care. So what we've got is this the, the profit that can be made from peddling the overly expensive drug is like a magnet or a thought-changing machine. Mm -hmm. So it focuses us on biotechnology instead of the fact that most of the type 2 diabetes has to is a product of a holistic way of life. But there's no money in that. So we have in the United States, to get back to your original question of why is our health so bad, we've got a reversal of our allocation of national resources from the kinds of social and lifestyle issues that account for 80% of our health, but we draw those resources into our health care. So we have flipped the ratio of medical spending and social lifestyle spending. Right. So unfortunately, all the money goes into the pockets of the investors and the executives at the drug companies instead of going to people who actually need lifestyle. It's almost it's like a wealth transfer from people who really need lifestyle help and people who need actual care to people who provide fake and sometimes often very often real, but very often also just fake innovation that's designed to just make money. And Ah, it's so frustrating. That's exactly right. And and just um, so you know what company you're in, Angus uh, Dayton, who's a professor of economics at Princeton and a Nobel Prize laureate, said exactly that, that it, our healthcare is an exquisite method of wealth transfer. Let me flip this. Where does capitalism do well with respect to healthcare? Because we do create absolutely amazing things like mRNA vaccines. So I don't want to say like, ah, oh, you know, Hashtag communism. This is all a big sham, right? We do a lot of amazing things that no well, one else Well, the mRNA can do. vaccines were communism or socialism. I mean, it, <laughs> yeah, it was the it was the National Institutes of Health that developed it, not private enterprise. Do you think that? Uh, so, so, well, let me let me move that around. The reason that that exists is also it is in a capitalistic system, right? It might be. A, a, I want to I'm I was half joking here, but I also want to make it clear that like the reason that these institutes are able to do these kinds of things is because we have a good system in place for for innovation in the country. Uh, but maybe you disagree with that. I don't know. What do you think? I, we don't need this much innovation. We need targeted innovation. We need oversight so that we don't get these 
absurd drugs like Adjahelm for uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, we need to have a mechanism. We allocate our research funding by private enterprise deciding where they're going to make the most money. That, that's the extent of the planning that goes into this. And what we need is a national program to decide how to allocate our medical research investment to produce the most positive results in our society. That's the problem. Where do you see this all going? Do you see this problem continually getting worse with people extracting rents from all of us as consumers to the detriment of society at large? Or are we looking at some reasonable reforms and regulations coming out to play here? Um, we are not looking at reasonable regulations with our current um, way of doing political business. They are not going to get there. They're going to say there should be a $35 copay on insulin analogs. And let me just tell you about that one thing very quickly. That's a sham because a $35 copay on insulin analogs for people who don't need insulin analogs means the drug companies continue to make all their money and the consumer gets protected from ex higher copays. The consumer only pays $35. The insurance company has to pay the rest of the copay they don't have to pay, and the drug companies make their money. But the sham of it is that there are biosimilar insulin analogs that are going to come online very soon, a year or two from now, and they're going to cost $35, not copay. They're going to cost $35. You can make these $300 a vial insulins for $35 and make money, and that's what's going to happen. So if the drug companies can foe, yell, and scream that they're getting socialized and allow this $35 copay plan to come in, which will help some people, I'm not saying it won't, but if they can do that, what they're going to do is if you fast forward two years, they're going to create a market where the consumer who's been very happy, the type 2 diabetic who's been very happy on his or her uh, insulin analog that's costing $5,000 a year, um, they're going to be able to stay on their insulin, insulin analog for 35 bucks, so their doctor won't be able to switch them over to a biosimilar product, which is equally effective, but the drug companies are going to be saying that they're not equally effective. So this plan to have $35 insulin copays is a plan that's designed to protect the brand name insulin an analog manufacturers. And that is proposed by Democrats, and that is, and the and and the drug companies are saying no, that you know that's socialism. They may not be saying it explicitly about this, but they're going to fight it tooth and nail. It's interesting because all this protectionism for these specific brands is really, it's the opposite of capitalism. And then they're saying no, no, it's socialism if you make us actually compete fairly. It's a exactly. nice little exactly there. and. It, it, Yes. And in the book, I quote Milton Friedman, who says, look, government shouldn't do very much, but it should make sure markets work and it should make sure contracts are honored. And we're just not doing that. Yeah. The, the problem is market failures don't correct themselves. If I remember themselves, anything. That's from exactly Econ 101. right. Yeah. You got it. They just don't. They, they just don't worse. correct themselves. And Americans don't believe in government. And pharma owns the PR microphone. And we don't have a solution. There's only one way out of this. I'm not saying that it would be easy, and I'm not saying that the odds are good. But the only way out of this is for the public to become educated enough so that they can create more pressure on their politicians than the money and the lobbying does from the pharmaceutical side. The public has to stand up and represent its interests. The doctors need to join them. The, uh, the healthcare purchasers, the companies that are buying health insurance need to join them. But that tripartite uh, coalition of consumers, purchasers, and healthcare providers has to become a stronger political force than the pharmaceutical industry. And we are very far from that. And the reason why I'm doing this podcast, and I hope why you're doing it, is because this is the only way that we can start to build a knowledgeable base that can then go ahead, people can then go ahead and inform themselves 
and start to move towards a, a, a coalition that can become politically strong enough to force change. Are you hopeful at all? Because I don't want to leave on this like really sort of depressed, like, hey, we have to just fight these multi-billion dollar behemoths or we're all screwed. Is, there, is yeah. that where we're leaving it? Yeah, yeah. well, I, that's where we have to leave that. But I do want to leave uh, on, a, on a much more upbeat note. Yes. <clears throat> 80, <clears throat> because most of what we know comes from the drug companies and we know it because it's going to make them money, what we don't know is that 80% of our health is determined by how we live our lives. And those of us who are fortunate enough to be able to live in a community that has decent food and allows you to exercise safely, uh, the 80 percent's all on our side. So when we're worried about whether we should take a statin, for example, to prevent heart disease, what we need to remember is I, I, we could do a whole show. We could do a five-hour show on statins. I'd be happy to do it with no notes. But that's not the problem. The problem is that they've gotten... The, the, the drug industry has gotten inside the consumer's heads and the doctor's heads, so they spend their time at the doctor visit, the physical exam or whatever, deciding whether somebody should be taking a statin or not and following the guidelines and all that stuff about statins. And the truth is that we should be asking a different question, not should I take a statin, but how can I minimize my chance of developing heart disease? That's the real question. Mm. Is if you have a heart attack and you have a low cholesterol, that low cholesterol doesn't help you very much. Right. Um, so the question is not, should I be taking a statin? The question is, how can I minimize my risk of heart disease? Maybe 20% of that question ought to be addressed to statins, but 80% of it ought to be addressed to how healthy your lifestyle is and then not stop there. But what are the impediments that you have to adopting a healthier lifestyle? And as a family doc, I took this very seriously. And when I would engage, say, a new patient in a conversation like this and, and tell them what I'm telling you, and I would say, look, you know, if you want to reduce your risk of heart disease, you've got to make lifestyle changes and you've got to exercise five times a week and um, not smoke and drink in moderation and eat a healthy diet. Um, and they would say, sure, doc, sure, I'm going to do that. And um, I'd make a return visit for a month and they'd come in in a month and they would, 95% of the people would say, I didn't make those changes. And I would say, I didn't expect you to, but now you're starting to gain some knowledge about why you couldn't, couldn't make those changes. Now you're starting to see how to proceed towards really making those changes. The drug industry will send, you know, spends a lot of money creating the memo, people won't change, so just give them drugs. They will change. It's been proven they'll change. In double-blind studies, they'll change. But the doctors have to get on board and partner with their patients to reframe that conversation so it's epidemiologically accurate. And we don't spend all our time talking about statins. We spend 80% of our time talking about how to adopt a healthy lifestyle and how to overcome our individual resistance to that. Dr. Abramson, thank you so much for your time here and your expertise. It is a little bit of a, a, a downer, right? Because it seems like a very, very hard battle to win. But education here, and the reason I'm doing this podcast is so that, you know, a few hundred thousand more people are aware of what's going on here and, uh, and, and are educated enough to say, wait a second, maybe I don't want this in my community. Right. Right. And, and let me just reiterate, it is a downer. I'm telling you a downer about the totality of the impact of the biotech industry on American healthcare and financial well-being. Uh, it's a downer. But it's also a liberating upper to understand and liberate yourself from this sort of spider web of misinformation and look your doctor in the eye and say, Doc, I'm not here to ask you for the latest medicine. I'm here to ask you, on the totality of your knowledge, what should I do to make myself healthier with regard to the issue we're talking about? And if you can help your doctor reframe that question, you've gone a long way towards improving your healthcare system. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for checking out this entire episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show. If you're interested in exploring this topic further, check out The Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. 
There, we dive even deeper on this and many other topics. In the audio podcast, I also close open loops, cover things discussed off camera, off air, and give some parting lessons from our guest. You can find The Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any podcast app, or at jordanharbinger.com. And also, if you found this episode useful, please share it with those you care about. Last but not least, like, comment, and subscribe.